Welcome to the Indie Writer Podcast, where we talk about all things writing and indie publishing. Today, we are excited to talk about organizing your writing with Gigi Pandian and Caitlin Flatt. So I'll tell y'all listeners a little bit about them. Gigi Pandian is a USA Today bestselling and award-winning mystery author, breast cancer survivor, and accidental almost vegan. The child of cultural anthropologists from New Mexico and the southern tip of India, she spent her childhood being dragged around the world on their research trips and now lives outside San Francisco. She's the author of more than a dozen mystery novels. The latest is Under Lock and Skeleton Key, which the New York Times called wildly entertaining. She's been awarded Agatha, Anthony, Lefty, and Derringer Awards, was a finalist for the Edgar Award, and is a co-founder of Crime Writers of Color. Caitlin Platt is an author and graphic designer living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Platt was raised on a farm in rural Deer Park, Alabama, a place which offered inspirations for her short stories, Eleanor and Only God Can Tell. Platt's parents contributed in growing her personal quirks and writing passion. Her mother encouraged her creativity and her father, when he wasn't putting her to work herding cattle, planting crops, building fences, or welding, encouraged her to do something with what she made. Sounds like you both had some very interesting lives growing up. (laughs) Um, Platt's debut novel, The Living God, was published in 2019, with The Ever War arriving in 2021. She has several short stories appearing in writing block anthologies, and The Blood Key, the third installment to her Equitas series, arrives in late 2022. Welcome to both of you. I'm so excited to have you both here. Yeah, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah. So I know that both of you are very organized. I've heard you (laughs) speak and talk a little bit about your different ways that you keep things organized. And so that's why I wanted to invite both of you on the show. So why don't we just start with the basics? I mean, some people might not be organized at all, and some people might be like hyper organized. So let's see if we can meet somewhere in the middle here. So Let's talk about just basically how you keep your writing projects in order. And I believe both of you are juggling multiple projects at a time. Why don't we start with Gigi? Sure. So I am someone who who likes to think of myself as a very organized person. And so I have so many theoretical systems, you know, that I, I, I should be implementing. But I'm going to, for the basics, I'm just going to start with what I actually do in reality. And we'll see if we can, you know, talk about different things over the course of this chat. But, um, but just the very basics, the two most important things for me in terms of staying organized are I use Dropbox to back up all of my files. And so even if I have a terrible naming system or do something badly, I at least know that I have not lost what I've done. So it is somewhere. So I have it backed up to the cloud. So any sort of system that backs up to the cloud that is not just on your computer so that it can crash and lose everything. Um, so that that is the first thing I do to stay somewhat organized. And then the, the other thing that I really rely on is I'm a big fan of Scrivener in order to have all of my writing files in one place. So that writing program, I know that so many authors use Word and and different things and calendars and things, but I I can't, I can't do it. I'm, I'm not organized enough to be able to keep things straight. So in Scrivener, the way it works is that you can use it in so many different ways, but it's, it's like a repository. So you can dump so many things all in one place. So for each book that I'm working on, I have a Scrivener file and I can export that in different ways and have things different places too. But I always know that everything I'm working on is in there and I can track um, progress in terms of word count and I can have different images in there and I can do timelines and I can have outlines in my text. So those are are the two things that I actually use on on a daily basis to stay organized. I have been Definitely. saying Scrivener Go wrong ahead. my entire life. I've been saying Scrivener. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, to each their own. Yeah. 
Um, I, I also use a similar system, but I go through uh, Google Drive. That's where I, I basically write the first few drafts in Google Docs because it auto saves and it's on the cloud and I can access it anywhere. So I, I use Google Docs um, to organize all of my files at the beginning of a project. So I have, I do multiple projects at a time. So I have different folders and different documents to keep up with world lore and character names and profiles. And uh, when I get to the finishing stages of a draft, um, when it gets to the nitty gritty of editing, I take it into Scrivener, which I've been saying oh. Scrivener. I just was introduced to this. I just finally got it. I broke down. I was like, I'm going to give it a try. And I fell in love. And I'm probably only using 10% of what it can do um, because it can do so much. All the stuff that I'm technically doing in Google Drive, I could do in Scrivener. And um, but one of the things I love about it is I can export as a uh, any kind of EPUB or Mobi, uh, just basically convert it to an ebook directly from there and send it to my beta readers or better readers and have them look it over. So that's basically what I do. So it's a sim- similar process. Yeah, that was amazing. So I just read Caitlin's um, beta read and it was <laughs> so nice to be able to just open it on my yeah. Kindle and read it without having to page sometimes even the publishers don't send me an epub when i have um arcs to read they'll send me a pdf and i'm like i can't read a Mm. pdf on my candle so (laughs) that was really cool i love scrivener too though i'm like a super scrivener fangirl i should get you to do a tutorial (laughs) and i definitely i actually have done it a few times and i I'm laughing because, Gigi, when you were talking with Alex, it was Sisters in Crime, right? It was the Sisters in Crime conference that you two yeah, spoke yeah, on. Yeah, that Alex yeah. Sugar and I were talking yeah. about. Yeah, so there were tons of people in the chat. And half the people in the chat were like, oh, I love Scrivener. It's so great. And the other half were like, I don't want to try anything new. Like, you didn't mm-hmm. actually have to say anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but they did anyway because they were just like... I'm a word person. Like you, you can be both. <laughs> it's okay. I use Word and Google Docs and OneDrive and Dropbox, mm-hmm. <laughs> Scrivener, all the things. Yep. Okay. So we talked a little bit about those tools that you both use um, technologically. Are there other? Do you use like Trello or? Um, like to-do lists on Google Calendar or anything like that for any of your different things you do? Um, I am a Google Calendar fanatic, I think. I have calendars for everything. Like I have a family calendar and I have a writing calendar and then I have a calendar um, for like uh, production and promotion. And I can, I like Google Calendar because I can turn some of them off when I need less noise and I just want to focus on one specific I guess task plan Um, and I have I use agenda uh, to keep track of project it's like a little project management tool sort of through I know it's uh, it's Mac based but the OneNote functions very similarly if you don't have a Mac Um, and it's just it's great for lists and planning and kind of coming up with a writing calendar and a production calendar. So I have tried so many different organizational systems. I've tried Trello. I've tried tasks in Google Calendar. I've tried all sorts of things. And I've tried and failed so many times that I've just gone old school, basically. I'm a very visual thinker and I love just seeing a real calendar and being able to block off time. One thing I haven't done that other writers I know who are also visual thinkers have sometimes gotten like a three month write on wipe off calendar for Mm. their wall so that you can do your planning there. Um, But I just will have like paper pages, you know, so that I can actually see And I'll sometimes do color coding there. And one of the reasons that I like Scrivener better than other programs is because it is so visual too. So it's the closest to paper that I can get. And so how Scrivener, you can, for folks who aren't familiar with it, 
you can really, in addition to the texture writing, you can see like for each scene or chapter, you can also write a little note card of like the key points that happen in there. And then you can do a view where you're just seeing your note cards that it looks like they're just on a cork board. And I actually have next to my desk here, a, an actual physical cork board where I, you know, can tack up different notes, either in terms of story structure or in terms of calendaring, whatever I'm working on. But just being able to physically see those things visually on paper is so helpful to me. And I'm also someone who drafts the first draft of my novel on paper too. So I'll usually fill a few paper notebooks about on a story before I move to the computer. So all of those things are just the same way for me as a visual thinker that I've realized what works for me in terms of both creating story, but also staying organized for how I am dealing with finishing a different book project. And so I've been now, this is my 10 year anniversary of being a published author. So I've been doing this a while and I've tried all the things. And I think the most important thing for organization is to just not give up. And so if you see somebody else who's more organized than you and think, oh, well, I'll never do that. And so I could never do that. So I'll give up, but just really figure out the things that work for you. Cause I've, I've really tried and failed so many different programs and I have so many different apps installed. And I'm like, and when I will look at my phone and I'll be like, oh yeah, three years ago, I tried that thing and it's just <laughs> sitting there using up space and I just don't use it, but that's okay. You can figure out what works for you but I would just say figure out something don't give up just because the first five things you try you fail at because it's not a failure we're just all completely different I think also writers are um, not always because we're all creative we're not always going to be the most organized people and that's totally okay yeah I I'm more of like I need to have everything organized all the time like with my calendar and my time management and all of that stuff like my to-do list but you don't want to see my house like I cannot keep the house in order and everybody's like but you're a librarian I'm like yeah but but I organize books not furniture <laughs> I'm lucky so, because my husband has a touch of OCD so he's the reason our house is clean <laughs> I, my husband throws his shoes like everywhere like as soon as he gets home they just land somewhere mm -hmm. um yeah so I think Gigi you kind of went along this track in the last question so you start by drafting in a notebook does that make you more of a pantser or you know do you go back and forth between plotter and pantser which I think we've talked about like most writers know the term so we're just gonna uh, not explain that but so I actually recently heard um Joanna Penn the author um talking about her process as being a discovery writer okay. as opposed to plotter versus pantser and oh, I, like I, I love that way yeah. of thinking about it because to me that means a combination of the two where you can really you can really be thinking about the structure and what's happening, but discovering things as you go. And I still primarily think of myself as an outliner, but the more books I've written, the more I realize that it really just is my security blanket, that I can't write well without feeling like I have the structure of the outline. But then from once I actually start writing and get into the story, the outline inevitably, it goes completely out the window. I listen to my characters and where they're taking me and I discover things as I go. And most of the time I'm wrong about even things that I thought were totally clear. But once you go with what your characters are doing, then you'll be like, oh, this is actually where the story is going. And that's, that's so much of the fun of writing. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'm including that now and every time I ask the eternal question. <laughs> Plotter, pantser, or discovery writer? I like that. And so that seems to work with what you do with your calendars and your whiteboard and every and Scrivener. Everything kind of is synergistic with that. Yeah, because you can move around paper and you can move around um, the note cards in Scrivener. So you can really just shape things so easily as you figure things out and you can move things aside but not get rid of them and then figure out where they end up fitting. How about you, Caitlin? Where, where do you fall in the continuum? I really like the term discovery writer. I think that's what I've evolved into. Um, I... 
I, for the longest time, thought of myself as a pantser, and I think I was, especially with the first few um, things that I wrote, or and with the Living God, and part way through the Ever War, I was like, maybe I should start planning this out because <laughs> I rewrote the Living God like four times because I was just discovering it as I went and realized some plot points didn't work and I needed to rewrite things, and so I rewrote it from the ground up at least twice. Um, so now I have started this approach where I take, uh, I write little chapter synopsises and I go chapter by chapter of what I think should be happening in those chapters. And I, like um, Gigi mentioned about how I'll start writing it that way and somewhere along the way, go completely off the rails and change what I was going to do. And it's usually for the better because when I'm planning, I have an idea of what I want to happen but then I find a better route through the discovery of the characters and their voice and where they kind of want to go with the story. So um, I think I've evolved into a hybrid. I think that I would definitely refer to myself as a discovery writer now, too, because I always start with an outline and the whole thing is like perfectly beat, you know, the, you know, the break into two, the opening image, like all of that stuff. And then um, it just totally changes and I have to start over. <laughs> so I like, <laughs> I like not being married to that like outline from day one. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about something I wanted to ask both of you too. That's kind of like a tangent from that. Because your books are all so, they hit the plot points, you know, in very effective ways. And especially over the course of a series, how, if you're discovering it, how does that affect the whole story arc? Gigi, you want to go first? Yeah, I'm trying to think about the best way to answer that because my answer is a little bit mushy, to be honest, because so much of what I do as a writer is because I'm a huge reader. And so everything I write is falls somewhere in the mystery genre because mysteries are what I absolutely love and have ever since I was a small child. Those have always been my favorite types of books. And so I've read so many books and absorbed so many mysteries that so much of what I'm doing at this point is kind of intuitive in terms of what I know works for, you know, figuring out a story and characters. And so even though it's much harder to create than to read something else, I also feel like if we're going all into a story that those aha moments and seeing how things evolve, that for me, my subconscious was already putting those things in place. Because when I was setting things up to get to know my characters well and knowing what I want to do, even if I feel surprised when something happens, my characters were already setting me up to do that and already knowing inherently story structure from reading so many mysteries that I've always loved. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have to go back and revise afterwards, but there is kind of a natural progression if you're really enjoying your characters and the story you're telling. And so this is <laughs> one of my my biggest thoughts too, that even for folks who are, because people write for so many different reasons, but if you're writing because you really feel passionate about the genre that you're writing in, as opposed to writing to market, then you can really get so into that, that you kind of, you, you can tell where, where things want to go. If, you, if you're really loving your story and your characters there. Mm -hmm. I love that. Caitlin, yours is on my mind because I just wrote the, finished the beta read. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of revelations in book number three, which I won't spoil for everyone, but. Yeah. Um... <laughs> yeah the, and those are revelations that I, um, like I knew from writing book one were going to happen because technically I wrote all four of these books in college and I used them for a graphic design thesis, which I, so I, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to design books. Uh, I wanted to go into publishing and I needed books and I couldn't use existing books. So I decided to write a whole series. So basically wow. what I'm doing is rewriting it, but I, I've had um, those, those plot points in my head for years now. And most of everything I've ever written has been written through daydreaming months or years before I can get to it. And um, then I just kind of 
put it down on paper and that takes so long. If I could only write at the speed at which I think I would be very happy. And um, I, I uh, just kind of weave it all together and it feels natural. It feels um, like what I, it should be. And I've, I've taken an approach lately to fast drafting, which I think has helped a whole lot with getting those ideas out and fixing it later in the, in the editing yeah. stages. I've been doing that too. I really like it. Mm-hmm. Do you ever do that, Gigi? Oh, yeah. NaNoWriMo is how I started doing that. So National Novel Writing Month where, you know, mm-hmm. where you write a full draft in a month. I'm I'm a huge fan of that. Yeah, I did it. I did it the last two years. And so far, nothing that I wrote during November has yielded anything good, but it gave me a lot of practice for t- when I've had to like do an, a revision on a quick turnaround. So both of you have day jobs and so do I. So, and I imagine that a lot of our listeners do as well. So Caitlin, do you want to talk first about how you balance your day job with writing and the rest of your life? I don't know if what I have to say is a healthy thing to say. It's like, I am a workaholic. I don't know how to exist without a goal or something to do. And so, um, cause I'm, I, I work all day and I'm running a book club for people who like wine and like books, uh, called Vellum and Vine. And so I, I'm organ, I'm keeping that organized. So I'm trying to read the book for the month and I'm trying to write and I'm helping with the writing block with, um, some marketing and production stuff. And I guess the thing that's helped me the most is cutting out consumption of visual media like I used to watch everything that was on Netflix except for reality shows Mm -hmm. and I by only saying like okay these are the shows that matter to me and I will keep up with those but I'm going to put the time I would have put into watching all of this stuff that that is being produced I'm going to take that into uh, creativity so I, I'm reading and I'm writing more because I'm watching less TV and that's helped a whole lot. But I also stay up way too late and drink way too much caffeine. <laughs> I hear you on that one. <laughs> Gigi, how about you? What's your, you know, okay. writing okay. work life so balance? Like? I'm going to be the, the, the counterpoint on this one. So I'm good. We have, cause we, we've had so many of our, our similar in line with, you know, being the Scrivener mm-hmm. evangelist and all this. So, okay. So I am actually very different than Caitlin here. So I have made a concerted effort that I knew that I wanted to um, prioritize writing in my life, but also not at the extent, like I, I didn't all, I didn't want to go all in and just start full-time writing right away because of, of the pressure of that. And I want I want writing to be fun, but I also want to take it seriously. So my choices in my day job is that I have made the, I made the decision many years ago that I wasn't going to pursue a traditional ladder to like move up in, in the traditional way, because I didn't ever want a job where I would be on call all the time. I wanted something where I could find a job that I really enjoyed. So it wasn't draining and that would only have set hours. And so I work at a nonprofit where they're um, in a role where I can, you know, set my own hours, you know, and so stay on top of my work, but I don't have to be on call and be doing that other time. So I've for many years just set my own hours during that. So I knew very much that I could have big chunks of time for writing even during the week that wasn't just at night or at 5 a.m. And so, but I did have to make choices. And so people would often say, oh, your boss is leaving. Why aren't you applying for that job? You know, that mm-hmm. you could totally move into that. I, it, it is difficult to not fall into that trap of wanting to feel like you can do that and are, are moving up. And so even though I haven't stayed static and have been able to have other, or other pro- professional day job growth opportunities, it has been something that I have had to think very strategically about so that I'm making the right choices so that I don't accidentally find myself in a job role where I, Mm -hmm. either that it is taking up too much of my energy 
or being on call or ending up having to work more hours than I should be working to get things done. And so that has been challenging because you do, it, it's not the normal way that people approach that. And so I have had to be very serious about my boundaries and what I wanted to do. And so I do work hard at that and show my value with, you know, what I'm giving there. Um, and so it actually only has been then I am now working part time because writing, you know, writing, my writing wasn't like an immediate, you know, super bestseller, right, you know, out the gate, because hardly anyone is. And so you hear about those, mm -hmm. you know, success stories about right out the gate, but it really is for most of us something that you really have to grow into. And so now that my writing is doing well, I can step back and do part time, but also have the security of having a job that has healthcare benefits and that I don't have to be stressed out about how much exactly is my writing making and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So I feel like it's been, it, it has been something that I've had to think very carefully about how to carve out that time, but it absolutely is doable to carve out the time and think about what you do want your job to be and not, you know, don't let yourself get pulled in directions that you feel compelled to do by other people because it's what we should be doing but we can really um shape our own lives with our writing and i've um it hasn't always been easy but i've i'm very happy that i've made those decisions um to get here now i really admire that i have uh difficulties pull like i feel i don't know like ingrained with what i do as a profession like it i feel like i can't pull back like i've always got to be a hundred and ten percent. I don't know mm -hmm. if that was like drilled into me by working on a farm or, or by <laughs> capitalism or what. It's mm -hmm. like I don't know how to save a part of myself for the things that I want to do, you know, the most. I, so I admire that you took that initiative. And it was one of those things, too, though, that I um, I had external help that I had uh cancer 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it was 11 years ago that I was diagnosed with breast cancer in my 30s. And then this is my 10 years of being cancer free and being a published author. But so it really was that cancer diagnosis that really made me reevaluate life priorities. Mm -hmm. And that was when I went all in being like, I really want to do this writing thing seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started working the more, um, the funky work hours, even when I was working full time and realized I really do have to prioritize writing, but not at the expense of not having any free time because that was another, you know, like one of those, you know, like, cause cancer does make you realize what's important in your life in terms of your loved ones and what you want to spend time doing and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And so I had that external pressure that really, you know, pushed me to really figure out what I wanted to do. Yeah. I admire that too. I've always say that I'm going to set boundaries and every time I do, it's amazing. <laughs> but then there's also so many things I want to do that I can't all pack in all those things into one. So I'm sure you've had to make decisions about that too. So like, much. It's so yeah. hard. There's so many things to do. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, maybe, I think that's why I write about multiverses and, and time travel. <laughs> like I want to live all the lives and I need all the time. <laughs> I know. I know. I gave up a lot of TV too, but I can't give up reading like that's the one thing people are like why do you yeah. read so much I'm like because I love it and it makes me less stressed <laughs> so mm -hmm. yep. sorry yep. that's the thing I'm not giving up but everything yeah. else is like books bassoon kids like that's my whole life <laughs> so that that was a that's a really good um a lot to think about I appreciate both of your answers on that one kind of going back in the other direction about uh organization skills and resources, where would you recommend writers start if they're, you know, I feel lost, I feel adrift, where can I go? I love the writing organizations that I am a member of. And so there are so many tr different um, terrific writing groups that are out there that provide support in so many different ways, both in terms of resources, you know, like helpful tips and webinars, but also a sense of community and finding critique partners and other people who you can just talk through 
all of your questions and get motivation and, you know, to stay on track with everything. And so as a mystery writer, um, Sisters in Crime is one of the organizations that was the first most helpful organization when I didn't know anyone in the, the mystery community that I joined Sisters in Crime and um, am still a member now. But they have, for example, even just um, online writing meetup groups. So you can, if you can carve out an hour, you can go to a write-in and do like that. But so in every genre that um, people write in and also just more general writing organizations as well. Um, they're just, um, I'd say groups is the writing organization groups is, is the, the biggest thing because then through them, you can find so many different resources for whatever type of thing you're looking for. How about you, Caitlin? Where would you send a newbie writer, flailing writer? The organizations is a, a good uh, place to go. Like um, I'm a member of the writing block and I get so much help from people in that. And um, strangely, Twitter, like book Twitter can be really helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use like hash the hashtag writing community and a bunch of people would answer your question. Um, and just uh, looking in your local area for writing groups and that because it's like, I think with COVID, we got so used to being virtual, but it is nice to speak to people face to face about the things that you enjoy. And um, so I, I, I'd recommend those things. And if you're trying to get organized, just, you know, start making folders of things. <laughs> Everything goes in a piles. folder. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. Organized piles of chaos. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I like that idea. Just being like, okay, I don't have a system. How do I start creating this system? I mean, just that would start be, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That would be like the eternal question about my house. Like I can't get my house mm -hmm. organized. Maybe I have my calendar. I have like my awesome calendar, my awesome to-do lists with my goals for like the next month, three months, six months in a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't have, you know, I'm sitting in this room that's full of junk. So if, if you were the writer sitting in the room that's full of junk, it's good advice. Just start putting the junk into like piles. Mm -hmm. And go to the home that... goods of writing and <laughs> get containers and start putting stuff in containers. <laughs> containers the containers of writing yeah. I just have too much stuff I guess mm -hmm. that would also apply to time if you're trying to do too much you can't I think it on there can also apply to projects because I have way more ideas and uh, books that I want to write and short story ideas than I know what to do with and that's just I, I even organize those into file of uh, full folders. I'll create a folder for each project idea and I'll just whenever I, I'll just dump information into it. And someday maybe I'll have time to write that book and then I can just go to that folder and I'll have all the stuff. Oh, I, that just makes me think of like all the Scrivener projects I have that are not finished. All of my oh. ones that I'm not working on, I actually just have one Scrivener file with separate subfolders in that. Mm -hmm. So because otherwise I think my brain might explode for seeing all of the unfinished projects. So I do have <laughs> just the one Scrivener file that's, you know, the future projects. Mm -hmm. And then I can go into those folders. And some of those folders are bigger than others. And some are just one little file that says, mm -hmm. here's a cool title and character idea for this that yeah. would be fun to write one day. I am in love with that idea and I might do that as soon as we get off the call because <laughs> that is way less overwhelming than what's on my computer right now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It makes you just feel so like, I will never, it's like the TBR list. It's like, I will yeah. never finish every book on the TBR list. That's awesome. Yeah. That all sounds really good to me. I'm also being a member of Sisters in Crime and the Writing Block. Wholly recommend both of those organizations. And okay, so the last thing that we always ask our guests is what are your favorite craft resources? Um, so I have a few. I love Pro Writing Aid. I um, It is really great for like 
um, the last, not the last pass at editing. Like I, I hand it to a professional editor for that, but like before handing it to them, I go, I run it through pro writing aid and I recently found out it connects to Scrivener. So it does. Um, that's really nice. So, and it catches things that I would have missed because I'm not a professional editor and I, I hope it makes it easier on the editor that I do use. Uh, <laughs> it does. It, and um, so, and then we've already mentioned Scrivener or Scrivener. And another thing that I use is Be Focused, which is a, um, it's a app that cuts your um, work time into segments. And there's this um, theory that you're more productive if you can work in short bursts. So it's like 25 minutes and then five minute break. And it keeps you you're less likely to want to procrastinate. You're like, okay, I have 25 minutes to work on this. And then you get five minutes of procrastination if you want. And you're, uh, so I use that to help, to help me keep me, keep me focused. Cause I'm a little bit ADHD and I, I tend to, anything will distract me. But if I have a um, time frame or a deadline, I tend to like hyper-focus. And um, another thing that I have only used about 10% of, but I think it's really cool if you have an expansive world, like if you're the Tolkien or George Lucas of whatever you're writing is Campfire Write, and it's kind of like lets you build a wiki of your um, of your world building. So it's things that you can reference, and I think you can let other people see it too. Like, so if you wanted your fans or something to see all of this information, they never thought they needed to know about your world building. You can use campfire, right. To develop it. Like it lets you build out languages and magic systems and interactive world maps. It's really cool. That's really neat. Gigi, how about you? Any organization tools, craft books to read apps, you know, anything that'll help People. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to mention two things here, both of which are, are old school, not talking about any apps or anything, but just uh, the, the, the first tip for um, being, you know, organized and focused is just to um, stay off the internet and your phone for when you're doing your writing. So for me, I first thing in the day is when I do my writing before going online at all because there's just so much in the world to distract you that really just regardless of whatever tools we're each using to stay organized the only way to actually you know follow those things is if our brains can focus and do that so um when I'm doing my writing like I use a program called focus um that I will sometimes like if I can't be trusted I'll turn that on to pick (laughs) me off the internet But otherwise, I can just if I leave my phone in the other room, I can, you know, pretty much just stay focused on writing. Um, But yeah, so that's that's the biggest thing, you know, just to stay offline in order to, you know, stay organized and on top of things. And then um, in terms of craft resources, there's there's three books that I'll mention briefly, which are the ones that I always return to. Two of them were ones that I found incredibly helpful when I was finishing my first novel. And the third one is something that I, I refer to for each of my novels now um, when I'm working on them. So the first is Writing the Breakout Novel by Donald Moss. That's a book I used when I was finishing my first novel that really helped me th- see things clearly. And also Alexandra Sokolov's Screenwriting Uh, tricks for authors which is looking at how movies and screenwriting like divides things in terms of story structure and how novels are really uh, mirror that same structure and that book when I was finishing my first novel there was one place in the middle of the novel that I knew it wasn't working but I couldn't see why and as soon as I overlaid that structure from screenwriting over my novel I saw exactly what I needed to put that last piece of the puzzle together when I applied that structure, which I was already intuitively doing, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know that one piece. So then that was, that was how those two books are how I finished my first novel and got an agent. And then the one that I've been using a lot lately is Matt Bird's Secrets of Story. Hmm. And that has all these checklists of things for different, um, for different things that are meaningful in a novel. And you don't have to do all the, I think, you know, it's, it's, so many like hundreds of different things that you know can like lift up a novel in terms of structure and character and all these things 
So no novel has all of them, but it's just a really helpful checklist to go through. And the way that he explains mm. those, that I find is really helpful. So those books are probably the most helpful ones that I've found. But there's so many fantastic craft books out there. So just finding mm -hmm. the ones that resonate with you. Well, I feel like I hear other people, like I've heard of these books except for the last one, but they aren't like my go-to ones. So I think that I definitely should check them out mm -hmm. again just to find, you know, because I'm always recommending the same things. Sometimes it helps to have, you know, a little bit of a shake up. So I'm excited mm -hmm. that you yeah. gave us some new ones to check out. Well, I want to thank you both for being here, especially in light of my shingles and my life being all over the place. <laughs> so I was probably rambling a lot. So I appreciate you both being like coherent and awesome. So why don't you, <laughs> Gigi, why don't you start, tell our listeners what's next for you and how they can find you? Well, so my, my next book that I have coming out is uh, at the end of August this summer, my next accidental alchemist mystery, The Alchemist of Riddle and Ruin, is coming out. Um, and so that is my paranormal cozy mystery series. Um, so that is what I have coming up next. And I can be, um, because my name is Gigi Pondian, I am the only one. So that is my, uh, that's what I am everywhere. So my website is ggpondian.com and all of my social media handles are at ggpondian. That's awesome. I think I'm the only Carrie Dubiel too. That makes it easy. I'm the only Caitlin Platt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm um, wrapping up. I'm getting ready to publish the third book in my uh, fantasy, like portal fantasy, fantasy romance series. It'll be out November, hopefully this November 2022. And um, it's The Blood Key. And I'm also organizing and curating a fantasy or fantasy or a mythology and fairy tale retelling that will hopefully be out in um, summer 2023 if all everything goes well hopefully. and you can find me yeah yeah hopefully fingers crossed <laughs> uh, and you can find me at my website katelynplatt.com and all of my social handles are at katelynplatt awesome well thank you again for both being here Thanks for listening to the Indie Writer Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will subscribe to hear our future episodes. We want to thank the Writing Block community for the continued support. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. We also have the Indie Writer Podcast Twitter now, or you can visit writingblock.com with an OK. Remember to subscribe, share, and tell your friends. Thanks, everyone, and happy writing.